yeah, we are recording. So uh, oh, okay. excellent. We managed to get there with technology. <laughs> <laughs> So Barbara, thank you for sparing some time to come and speak with me today. I'm, I'm really excited about picking your brain on some of these topics. Um, but before we dive into it, do you, are you happy just to share a little bit about you and who you are and how you got into to doing what you do? Yeah, sure. I mean, it goes back many years. I'm <laughs> sort of officially older at this point. And, uh, but those years have been so rich with so many experiences. So back, way back when, um, I, my second son was born with a lot of allergies, having a lot of trouble. And I, uh, as a new mom, um, needed to go on a special diet in order to help him. Uh, he was exclusively breastfeeding at the time um, and sought the advice of uh, a practitioner, alternative practitioner, because I didn't have any answers from the conventional physicians. Um, I ended up going on a diet. It worked not only for my son, but for me, because I was having um, a lot of autoimmune uh, difficulties triggered by, of course, hormones at that point in time. Now I know all these years later. Um, I have, gosh, at this point, four autoimmune diseases, and um, I can have learned to control them with diet. I interestingly do not have inflammatory bowel disease, and that is what I am specializing in. I love working with IBD because it is so responsive to diet, um, much more responsive than other diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis or um, skin diseases that have an autoimmune nature. I have vitiligo as well. Um, and so uh, it, but, I, and I uh, digress. Way back when, um, I became a dietitian uh, because I found a passion for uh, exploring why this diet was working. Um, my previous life was as a potter, interestingly, with a degree in fine arts. Um, and then in my pathway as a dietitian, uh, a GI doc, gastrointestinal physician sent me a patient said, I really need you to do this diet in this person. We've tried everything else and nothing works. We might as well try diet. It's um, still to this day, uh, a common response of GI docs to tell their patients that it doesn't matter what you eat, that diet has nothing to do with what is causing uh, your trouble in your GI tract, um, which now I think is totally ridiculous, but we're still striving to convince evidence-based um, and provide teaching to our uh, clinical fellow in the field. We're getting there. Um, so long story short, that patient did well. I jumped into research as to why this person did well um, and started to develop the IBD aid or IBD anti-inflammatory diet. And at this point, um, I'm sorry I called it the IBD aid uh, because it's not just about IBD anymore. I've used it over the years in a number of patients um, with inflammatory diseases such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes. Mm. Um, I have used it in rheumatoid arthritis and other types of uh, inflammation. Um, but I always come back to my IDB, IBD patients because they are unique to me. Um, there is definitely a, a gut-brain connection. I specialize mostly in the gut, but I have noticed that um, my patients with IBD are sort of the forgotten ones um, in terms of clinical care. Um, we, good physicians, I'm sure, um, throwing lots of medications, um, biologics, uh, forever changing um, the lives of these folks, uh, down to surgery at times. Ostomies, um, J-pouch is, is one that is incredibly difficult to treat because so much has been removed. We're left very little with which um, to make an impact. It all comes down to the microbiome. Maybe not all, because there is a genetic sensitivity, but that can be triggered through the environment and diet to trigger disease. And um, I'm currently engaged in a fantastic trial 
in pregnant women with Crohn's disease. And what we're doing is it's a three arm trial. We have a control group of healthy women. We have a, um, two intervent two groups, um, one of which chooses not to do the diet, but they do have the disease and other would choose to do the diet, diet in the third trimester um, based on preliminary studies where we could determine that the babies born to women with IBD have dysbiosis at birth. Um, dysbiosis is a term used for um, an imbalance in the microbiome and they have higher levels of calprotectin, which is a, a laboratory evaluation of stool. So we found that when we take that baby stool and inoculate uh, germ-free mice, that the mice then go on to be vulnerable to disease. So in our current study, the idea, human trials, um, real people, real lives, we are changing the diet in the third trimester using the IBD aid um, with essentially telephone consults. So it's a national American study and we can do telephone or Zoom and we're um, providing the women with what they need to know in order to change their diets to improve the microbiome, not only of themselves, but of the babies. Um, so that they, the babies can be born without such vulnerability to inflammatory disease going forward. Um, the funding is for women with Crohn's disease, but I have every confidence that this can work just as well with ulcerative colitis and a number of other autoimmune diseases such as type 1 diabetes. Um, so there's so much that drives me and my research. Um, it's the patients, it's the people, it's the stories that they tell and each one is individual and has a different bend to it. Um, it's life itself and being able to have such success through something that we can do every day, which is what we put into our mouths and how we make choices about how we live. Um, I have people writing to me all of the time telling me of their stories. I have a very busy clinic, um, outpatient clinic, working with patients, and I take on a few private patients. Um, and it's just gotten so busy. Um, I continue to do it. Um, even though I'm getting tired at this point, I, what I'd really prefer to do is to just focus on the research, which is, I think, where our future lies. But I can't deny that I learn so much from my patients and their reports to me of what works and what dis doesn't. And right now, we are developing a large database of foods that we are collecting from our people in research and correlating with um, not only individual species of uh, bacteria and yeasts and other fungi components of the microbiome, um, but ecological systems. And so one of the things that I have learned is that diversity is key. Diversity is key in terms of the microbiome, that the micro microbiota do not uh, act in isolation, just like we as human beings need a community to exist in, so don't they. And even some of the so-called adverse bacteria um, should not be eradicated necessarily, but should be kept in check or in balance um, with the beneficial bacteria. So that balance is achieved through a diversity of diet. Um, and I have learned to rely upon prebiotic foods uh, as the foundation of this diversity. And so prebiotic foods are those foods which nourish the growth and well being of beneficial bacteria who can then uh, not only digest our food and uh, for us, with us, and um, help to make vitamins from that food and convert to essential life-giving nutrients. Um, 
but also to keep in check adverse bacteria. The beneficial bacteria produce substances and it uh, can be um, roughly uh, categorized as short chain fatty acids. And uh, this picture that I shared with you, Alex, you can see that uh, at the bottom, SCFA, short chain fatty acid levels, um, what we want to do is produce those. And we cannot produce them. They have to be produced by the microbiota. Um, taking them in capsule form thus far has not been an efficient way to make an impact. It's the niche of the microbiota within the intestines and different parts of the intestines. They Each ecosystem lives in different parts of the intestines to produce such short chain fatty acids. Um, the biologics target uh, the same cytokines. Cytokines are inflammatory markers, which are chronically stimulated in inflammatory bowel disease, and they don't turn off. This creates a, a state of constant inflammation and in stimulating um, not only adverse bacteria, but also substances that are highly irritating and can erode um, and inflame the, in, the intestines. This creates a, a, a situation for the patient that can be unbearable at times, where they can't leave the house to participate in, in life uh, with not only work things and their potential and reaching their potential there, but also family and friends and um, loved ones. So by changing diet and having the hope that we can with or without medications. And so this isn't a, you know, instead of medication necessarily, this can be a complementary to medication to allow that medication to work better, to allow a more holistic well-being that the patient can achieve. Um, and um, I go back often to a case study of a, a fellow that I had uh, 15 or 20 years ago now who continues to do well to this day. Um, a fellow who um, himself is a teacher of medical ethics and um, arrived in my office on uh, disability, um, unable to teach, unable to reach his own potential because of his disabling symp symptoms. Um, he was at that point highly dependent upon corticosteroids for control of his symptoms. Um, and approximately four months later, he was giving the keynote address at the World Health Organization, entirely free of medications at that point, continued to follow his diet, which was in Austria. And uh, I would not recommend that as we go over, as we Americans go overseas, it's actually easier for me to eat my diet overseas than it is here in America. And I, I would take that as not a surprise for most people um, in that um, unhealthy foods, the poor quality diet is so much easier to consume and is everywhere available to us mm -hmm. and cheaper than one that is a healthy diet that also takes time and food preparation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's sort of just a brief story. Um, that's great. Yeah. Uh, did you have questions for me? Yeah, one question actually that came up um, when you were talking about the, the recent study. Um, let me just minimize my screen a second because I've got some notes here as well. So it's the sort of the Melody study yeah, that you were Melody referring Coast. to. Shall I give you back? Uh, no, that's OK. Don't worry. That works okay. fine. Um, but in regards to the births, were, were they or are they all sort of vaginal? Are there some that are kind of C-section as well? Oh. Or? Great question. Uh, and so let's see. I do actually have a slide on that one. Uh, 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 
I don't know. There's so many slides that I have. <laughs> okay, so so we are recording the ones that are vaginal and, and women with Crohn's disease are much more likely to deliver C-section. Right. Um, there is a uh, bathing that can be requested by women who choose to deliver uh, via C-section where they can request the vaginal um, fluids uh, be um, manipulate, uh, manually applied to the baby at birth in huh. order to help the baby with their own establishment of the microbiome. So the babies are not born sterile per se. Uh, they have a, when they're born, their microbiome most closely resembles the microbiome of the mother at birth. Um, and then going forward, they uh, are affected by breastfeeding, of course, um, but also, but it would appear that their microbiome is still sort of um, foundationalized, if you will, by mom's GI. And so that vaginal birth is very important. Um, but we also see that uh, babies who are born with C-section without the vaginal bathing still have a microbiome that more closely resembles the mom, which is why we are attempting to change in uh, the microbiome of the baby, which is, seems to be, so much we don't know, but seems to be um, uh, beginnings of which are established in the third trimester. Could be before that, um, but there's so much we don't know. Mm. No, I think that's amazing. Um, okay, and then I guess to summarize some of what you um, also said after that, just really that the diversity of that microbiome, which is so heavily influenced by the diversity of our nutrition, um, is one of the fundamental things that we want to be considering. Um, and within that, obviously, short-chain fatty acids with butyrate being one of the primary ones and the role that this plays. So I guess with all that in mind, moving into the diets that you've mentioned and that uh, you co-authored a paper on, which is the inflammatory bowel disease anti-inflammatory diet. So do you want to, I guess, introduce the diet and the concept and, and some of what you've, you've learned over the years with it? Yeah, so that's a, a 2014 paper and I have learned a lot since then. <laughs> um, but the foundation of which is that uh, a, we can change the microbiome with diet, and patients do respond very nicely. Um, we, I, at the request of the GI docs, have now narrowed the diet into three phases instead of four. Um, although I'm always tempted to go back and do a fourth phase for various reasons, but we can get it back into that later. Um, so right now it's a three-phase diet, all of which is available on our website. I have always felt strongly that uh, we sh should not <laughs> protect our data. We should just give it to whoever wants it. Um, and so there's a lot of data floating out there that is not necessarily accurate at this point, Alex. Um, <laughs> and uh, so there's four components of the diet. And I always come back to that because uh, without the four components, you're not likely to get as good of a response. It's prebiotics, prebiotic foods. Um, and those are foods that are predominant in um, certain uh, fibers and types of carbohydrate, like inulin, which is one of the FODMAPs, um, oligosaccharides, another one of the FODMAPs, um, and their effects. So that's the prebiotics, uh, onions, leeks, artichokes, um, um, let's see, what else, uh, barley, uh, oats is foundational. Uh, sorry about that. Um, and um, other types of soluble fiber like ground flaxseed, chia seed, hemp seed. So it's important that we talk foods and not just um, uh, biochemical designations. <laughs> right. Uh, and in combination, though, of those foods plus modifying fatty acids. And what do I mean by fatty acids? It's foods that are um, uh, saturated fat, which is, uh, they would be solid at uh, room temperature versus um, unsaturated or monounsaturated or polyunsaturated fats. 
um, such as fish or olive oil, monounsaturated um, nuts and seeds, monounsaturated. So modifying those as opposed to sort of uh, different fatty meats and fried foods. So that's an important component of it, that we modify the carbohydrate and fiber intake of the diet. We modify the fatty acids of the diet. We integrate probiotic foods, which are fermented foods that grow their own live bacteria. And so these need to be consumed in a state that doesn't destroy the bacteria, I believe, to be effective. Um, and that would be foods like yogurt or uh, kefir or kefir or miso, um, uh, fermented foods like uh, kimchi and sauerkraut and, and these kinds of preserved foods um, that historically have been a part of our diet, but have drifted away as we got into refrigeration and uh, commercialization and processing. Mm. Um, they have become less available. Um, the third component of the diet, so we've got prebiotics, probiotics. The third component is adequate nutrition. So I see that many patients might choose to consume, say, one group of foods um, to the exclusion of other groups of foods. And this can be true in children as well as adults um, and our elderly, um, maybe through reasons of dentition, no longer being able to chew uh, salads and foods because they don't have the teeth to do so. This affects the microbiome. So, and in patients with IBD, um, they often avoid uh, fruits and vegetables uh, because of um, upstream digestion not being adequate. Um, and then the foods themselves being just sort of thrown into the gut um, acting as sandpaper to uh, tissues that are already friable or breaking, and it hurts, and it doesn't go well, and you don't get a lot of nutrients out of those foods because you're not breaking them down. So um, making sure that the patient has enough adequate nutrients on board to nourish the immune system and health, well-being, and growth, um, aging, all of those factors that go into our lives, and delivering those nutrients in a way that is tolerated by the gut. And so that's what the phases are about, that phase one is sort of liquefying, uh, pureeing, blenderizing certain nutrients so that they can be absorbed and processed. And so that the patient doesn't have to go without those nutrients, which as it turns out in our research, are essential to the diversity of the microbiome. And so it's not just about consumption of probiotics that um, nourishes the microbiome, but it's consumption of nutrients, like non-starchy vegetables is one of the essential components of a healthy microbiome. So how do you get them in if your gut isn't processing it very well and you feel nauseous and sick, or you're actively bleeding and you, there's no way you're going to be eating salads. You know, what do I eat is, is such a common um, concern. So that's the third component. And the fourth component, which is interestingly in my early days, what people focused most heavily on, which is um, avoidance. Avoidance of foods thought to be adverse. They nourish um, the bad guys. Uh, and uh, so in my early days, I noticed people are really good at removing things from the diet. <laughs> you think of diet, okay, I'm going on a diet, I'm gonna cut out all this stuff and I'll be fine. Um, and it's not true. If you don't add, it's three parts add and one part subtract. So yes, indeed, we do need to subtract certain foods. Um, I go with what I know from, um, although I have worked with some patients uh, in the UK, but I mostly go with the American um, diet where we're moving sugars and processed foods and foods that are heavily genetically modified, where this, even the seeds themselves of the wheat that is grown in the farmer's fields, um, for all the best reasons to, so that the bugs don't eat up all the wheat, um, our bugs don't enjoy that wheat either. 
Um, and so removing wheat has been foundational. Removing sugar is foundational. Removing lactose and in some circumstances, casein, um, which is the milk protein. I have seen some benefits of actually removing casein. So it gets a little complicated and you can dive into the details. Um, no, people don't have to be 100% compliant to get where they're going. I don't think that's, well, I know it's humanly possible, but is it achievable over the long term or is it necessary? And, and I would say no. If, if we can achieve remission through balancing the microbiome, then you sort of develop a natural resilience um, to environmental uh, challenges uh, of bad food or bad air. Um, stress itself definitely has an effect. Yeah. You know, so, so that's sort of the goal is to get to 80 to 90% of doing the right thing on a, on a daily basis. And then every once in a while, um, with awareness, you know, doing something, having some birthday cake, or, you know, <laughs> Uh, the things that come along in life that you want to take part in. Yeah, absolutely. I think those two key points, or those are two key points around the idea of what can I bring into the diet? What can I increase? Because you're right, I think to this day, our, our default thinking seems to be about what do I need to restrict and deprive myself of? Um, and I'm really glad you mentioned that because you reminded me that in that 2014 study, um, you kind of commented on the fact that um, the participants, I made a little note here, reached greater than 70% compliance with the diets. So I now cite your study as a way of saying that you know, we don't need perfection here. Um, right. If we can get to 75-ish percent, then you know, you're know you going to be moving in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so in research, yeah, we, we look at like, we bundle all the people together and some people don't do well, some people do do well, and we're looking at that a little bit more specifically. And I think that's where your company might come in. Like, okay, let's look at the people who made the changes and didn't respond. Mm. So what is different about those people? Um, truthfully, if I can get a good compliance, I think the percentage of people that I work with Almost all of them are going to respond, but there are those few that are always going to haunt me, Alex. <laughs> and I want to know why. And so, future directions, you know, are are going to be through um, what can we do? What what is it? What is it about these people? We are different. There isn't one diet that is going to fit all. Um, that's going to help you with the balancing a healthy weight. That's going to help you with um, optimal energy, you know, we need to um, give our patients, uh, the population, um, a better understanding of what they can do to help themselves. Because it is something that we do three times a day or more. Um, why isn't it the, the default at the physician's office that um, I'd like you to look at these aspects of your diet? And yes, we'll look at some medications and some other things. But um, nutrition and diet is incredibly powerful for changing lives and improving quality of life. Um, I, I just wish we had gotten to a point where we're at least willing to consider the development of dietary guidelines for inflammatory bowel disease. And that every GI doc says, well, you know, what you're eating is going to make a difference. And I want you to look into this, same as we do for patients with heart disease or diabetes. There's guidelines. And if at least we could start there. Um, and there are a number of researchers and investigators who are diving into this right now for inflammatory bowel disease. And there are some really good websites and some really good information. Um, what we need is a sort of a coalescence, um, a place to begin to bring us together because we do have a lot in common. What we are discovering are common threads, like the creation, uh, the creation, the, gen the stimulation of those short chain fatty acids. I think we can all agree on that, that that is essential to IBD. 
we, we really need to have those. And so how do we get those? You know, and, and so that's where maybe the process differs a little bit with the investigators. And, you know, scientists are always going to argue with each other. Um, but I'd like to at least provide the patients with a place to begin. Um, confusion is what I often come across in, in people that I'm working with. Um, they're, they're just left to their own devices. Uh, eat what doesn't hurt you. <laughs> and, you know, um, I've spent so many years studying nutrition and I am still learning, learning, learning every day. And my diet is not set in stone. Uh, the IBD aid is continually evolving without what I learn. I am, so we talked about the fourth phase and I want to add, like, uh, there's a lot of sort of um, uh, multinational foods that I've become aware of that have such potential. And um, America is a melting pot and um, these foods are becoming more common. And I want to integrate these foods so that we can, on a cultural level, address um, patients of a Latino descent. Um, you know, patients who have different sort of dietary patterns, because we don't ever want to forget that the first thing that happens when you put food into your mouth is the brain lights up and says, oh, that tastes good, or Ew, bleh, you know, spit it out, uh, or there's the texture, the feel. It's like totally beyond the intellect. And so it always has to be a number one priority to deliver a diet that helps to nourish the mental well-being as well as the physical well-being of the patient and that's why people continue on the diet is because they're after going through the transition taste buds change you can do that in a matter of weeks um and after that it's sort of like you know i i like this i choose to eat it it feels good it tastes good and why not mm. um then it's a matter of doing a little bit more cooking. Um, in our current pandemic, I think a lot of patients are doing that. They are <laughs> doing more cooking. And so that's been kind of one of the silver linings of, of our isolation right now. People are getting food delivered and they're cooking at home and, you know, looking online and mm. doing a few things that maybe they didn't do beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess on that, on that topic, Barbara, in regards to often your clients sort of being confused and being left to their own devices, um, where can people find more information about the IBD AID? The IBD AID, yeah. Yeah, um, sorry. IBD hyphen AID. So you could go to uh, keyword Center for Applied Nutrition at UMass. And we have a website and I've put tons of recipes up there. We're always taking some down and revising some with the, the dietary patterns. Um, people can contact me. There's another website and I wish I could remember the name of it. I'm happy to send it to you after okay. um, where it compares all the different GI diets together. Oh, wow. Um, and so that is quite helpful. It's by a, a Canadian uh, Lady Kim Beal has put a lot of effort into uh, generating that website. Um, so that can be a resource for people. Yeah. People, you know, need autonomy. Uh, we make our own decisions about what we want to eat or don't want to eat. Um, and the support that we have in family, friends, and the environment is also a component of that. Mm. Yeah. Um, it, you made some great points again in that paper around um, what seems sort of influence compliance of the participants. And you, you kind of talked about personal motivation, support from family and friends and skills in the kitchen. And again, it's very true. You know, I often we're working on a one to one basis, but that that one is within a family unit. And I've certainly heard many times that they found it challenging when they're having to cook for themselves, but then essentially cooking for other things for other people as well. Yeah. And so that's why we have uh, striven to uh, strive to make this diet one that's tasty for the entire family and healthy for the entire family so that we can satisfy the nutrient needs of the family. They don't necessarily need to know that. All they need to know is this tastes good. Yeah. Um, and so we are, and I've worked with kids and kids are quick to respond. Um, 
a lot faster than adults. Predominantly, I work with adults, but kids are such a joy. Um, so, yeah. Brilliant. And I guess just to, um, what's the term I want to use? I guess just to kind of mention ultimately one more stat from that paper, which is, I think quite remarkable and shows you the power of nutrition, which was around 100% of patients able to, were able to discontinue at least one of their medications out of those that um, sort of completed the program, so to speak, um, which is just worth, I think, emphasizing to give people an idea of how powerful this can be. Yeah. Um, and of course, I did work one-on-one uh, -on -one with each one of those people in that study. Um, and that is what we're doing in the Melody trial as well, because uh, only when someone achieves the diet are we able to see exactly what its effects can be. Um, and so, yeah, going forward, um, mm. we really hope to uh, continue to add to our database of foods that are acceptable. Um, we continue to look at foods that I think of as unknown. Um, I have a lot of people uh, writing me. There's a, an email, an IBD-8 email that people can uh, access me and asking me questions uh, of a more personal nature, even to down, here's my bread ingredients, is this okay? <laughs> um, and if I don't know, I'll tell you. Um, it's a journey that I, we take together, the patients and the researchers and the investigators and the clinicians. Um, it's sort of an exciting time to be doing what I'm doing. And I'm really hoping that over the next few years, it becomes much more prevalent. Yeah, yeah no, I think that's really well put. So I was speaking with a client just today actually around that sort of principle. And I use the, <laughs> I use the experience of when I've worked with clients who have a, a very analytical brain, like an engineer or someone, they can sometimes struggle a little bit because it's not black or white. Even though there's plenty of science here, it's still as much an art as it is a science, I think a lot of people are saying. Um, wow. And I think it's important to appreciate that. There is a lot of gray here. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Although yeah. I do like working with the engineer types because they kind of do what I ask them yeah, to that, do. Yeah, <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> Sometimes they don't get enough variety because it's like, well, no, I need to have this and this and this today. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is an art. It's an art. Yeah. And so this is where my background in fine arts maybe comes in. <laughs> Continue you, to create things. Yeah. And you mentioned at the beginning, I think, um, doing a little bit from a cardiovascular perspective. Oh, absolutely. Is yeah, We don't want to cause one thing to, to do another. That patient who... Uh, was speaking on the world stage, he had cardiovascular disease. Okay. Um, and uh, boy, I learned um, he had too much cheese <laughs> and his arteries start to clog up. So I was like, okay, okay, we don't do that. We need to modify the fatty acids. Um, so, right, there are things that are sort of basic to our biology. Um, we don't want to cause bad things by trying to fix something else. Right. Yeah. And the other thing that I wanted to bring up, um, because of the essential nature of experience, um, we are primed by our experiences um, and exposures. So uh, childhood and, and what we do on a daily basis. We have a teaching kitchen at UMass um, and cooking classes that before the pandemic we used to run. And it was so interesting to me that if I could just get somebody to come to dinner and we prepare the foods in the kitchen and we eat the foods together, that there are changes that take place in a decisional balance of the mind that even the most rigid of patients, the pickiest of eaters, mm -hmm. is willing to try something and evaluate its effects if they're invited to dinner. <laughs> And so the experience can get you past resistance on a number of occasions. And I think that that is an important part of how we need to deliver dietary change is to take away some of the grief that patients experience. Of, but I really love my, my foods that I'm eating right now. And how am I going to give up my brownies? Or, you know, it, it can be unthinkable. 
this emotional attachment and as it turns out physiological attachment that the bacteria themselves have a voice in choosing what you decide to eat and so often in removing these adverse foods from the diet the patient's cravings will increase so this is where it's affecting the brain signals to the brain we're dying here the bad guys are saying feed us and cravings and patients blame themselves it's not their fault it's we're going through that cleanse to get to the point where the signals you're getting are true the signals you're getting are from the healthy parts of you and that can take a little bit of time and it can be quite difficult for some patients um, sugar is a huge one in terms of its um, addictive type uh, hold that it can have on people, especially people who may have coexisting depression and stress. Yeah, oh, it's not an easy path, but it's absolutely doable, mm, especially with support and information and, and presentation of good food options that taste really nice. <laughs> Definitely. And I think that really got me inspired by you know the concepts of doing some whether it's like cooking demonstrations or it's bringing people together for that sort of experience ultimately um because so much of food also i guess you know there is the cultural the social element that um <laughs> hello <laughs> that has been <laughs> that has been lacking especially this year obviously um, yeah so those are some really powerful points i think for us all to to consider so we're doing Zoom classes now, cook Zoom cooking classes uh, <laughs> for medical students. Um, and I'm doing uh, a Zoom teaching on the 26th. I don't know if I could send you the link, but yeah. um, it's just where, you know, we're cooking together via Zoom. <laughs> and then I'll deliver sort of a, um, you know, a, a brief overview of the IBD aid. That's amazing. Yeah. Pretty. So it's out there. The information's out there. If people yeah. want to find it. It's just, you know, having somebody like you to direct them. You know, this is what you need. Let me get you some videos on how to prepare that. Um, right. Yeah. Where do you shop? Where do you find uh, these foods that I'm unfamiliar with? Mm. Uh, yeah. How does it taste? Yeah. And yeah. is my family going to like it? Right. Yeah. And that's, that's actually kind of the, the mission statement of Health Path is making health change easy. So that's kind of like our vision of what we're trying to do. So as you say, videos of helping people understand how to make these things, making shopping lists as, as a click of a button with their local supermarket, all of these sorts of things, because oh, beautiful. we're all so busy and overwhelmed. There are some fundamental challenges that most of us face when it comes to behavioral change. Um, so as making it as easy as possible, I think is a key part of it. So, uh, wow. yeah. We I can't should... wait till you guys come to America. Oh, ah, well, yeah, we will keep you updated. Um, <laughs> hopefully it won't be too long. <laughs> <laughs> Cause it's a great idea and a great concept. Um, you're right. People don't have the knowledge, the time, and sometimes the energy, if you're not feeling right. well. Yeah your company can say here here it is let us help you mm, absolutely so, and then for the rest of my life i might be able to you know build off of that yeah experience so yeah. kudos hats Definitely. off to you i'm glad you're doing what you're doing alex likewise <laughs> barbara is there anything i'm mindful of your time is there anything that you'd like to conclude with anything we haven't yet touched on that you just want to mention or re-emphasize uh, the website again for resources, you may be willing to post that or yeah, definitely. Uh, on, on your website and um, maybe you could send me the podcast and I can uh, post it on ours. Perfect. Yeah, no, I'll definitely do that. Yeah. Excellent. Barbara, thank you so much for your time. It's been a, a pleasure and hopefully we'll, um, we'll be able to connect again in the future. Yes. Very good. Stay in touch, Alex.